reading from the ESV translation. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases his strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Everything uh, in the computer world just goes haywire when I'm gone for a week. Uh, but I do appreciate uh, Dave covering and doing a, a great lesson on our, our purpose in singing last week when I, uh, Julie actually texted him at 5 a.m. that I was in the hospital. So I um, figured I wouldn't make it here by 9. And, uh, so I appreciate uh, all the prayers and thoughts in the last week and everybody asking how I'm doing. And uh, kidney stones are a funny thing. You can feel completely well. And about 10, 15 minutes later, I can have the worst pain I've ever felt in my life um, to last for a little while. Um, in fact, my level, you know, in, in hospitals and they ask you, you know, what your pain number is. The kidney stone is the only time it's ever really been 10. Um, I think I've thought that before, like when I put my thumb in a table saw and cut part of his thumb off with a razor blade and done some of those things, falling off, you know, roof, and, but never has it ever been a 10 until a kidney stone a couple years ago. And I, I don't know if last Sunday was quite as bad as a couple years ago, but it was pretty close. Um, so I appreciate uh, all the, the thoughts and prayers and, you know, it, Unfortunately, I've got, I've got a couple, three of them on the one side. They actually may be a leftover from a few years ago uh, when they broke up some. Might be the lingering of that, not new ones. But um, the, uh, either way, uh, I may come and go with pain. And, and one moment you might ask how I'm doing. Fifteen minutes later, I could be you know, laying on my, uh, si or my back in, in total agony. So that's my what I get to enjoy for a little while. The, um, I want us to think about this idea, and I actually had this ready for me last week. I thought how ironic. When I was kind of throwing up and because of the pain, you often just start throwing up, but um, because of in the midst of the pain, in the midst of laying down, in the midst of not being able to do anything, I thought about my lesson about growing weak. Um, and what I mean is really understanding that we are weak. Um, how, many, how many of you remember when you were young, you were being told you can do anything you want to do? You can be anything you want to be? Do you remember the age you were, or do you remember the first time you ever realized that was not completely true? <laughs> like you got to a point, you started growing up, and you went, I can't do that. You realize at some point, life experience told you, okay, that, you know, I'm not going to be an NBA star. You know, 5'11 guys who are not ultra quick don't make it. <laughs> so unless you have the DNA lottery winner, you're not going to do certain things. That's just the way it is. All of us have certain abilities and talents built within us. But all of us also have limitations in us. And, and one of the problems with the idea of weakness is very often, and I hear this a lot from people when they talk about people's faith being weak. And what they don't mean is that their faith is weak because they are a brand new convert and just started reading the Bible. So they can't have a, lot, a great deal of knowledge and trust in the faith because they don't know much. They don't mean that. They mean they're not being very faithful. They're not really being very entrusting. And that's really not what the word weakness means. The word weakness means something you are incapable of. So in the scriptures, it talks about weak knees or weak legs. That means your legs don't work right. 
What do we do for people who have weak legs? Well, they get you know, scooters, they get walkers, they get canes, or if bad enough, they get a wheelchair, right? And we have special laws to make sure everybody accounts for those people who have weakness because they're incapable, their legs don't work. That's what weakness is, and that's what it means. It's understanding you are incapable, especially and primarily to save yourself. And until you really realize that, that without God, you really aren't going to do anything of true significance. That until you get that, you, we will still kind of delude ourselves into thinking that we can do anything, be anything, be almighty, be all strong, and we just can't. And it is in our weakness that often we really find God. I'll give you a little story. One of the reasons I mentioned kind of the, the, the kidney stone, told you a little bit about it, is because about to time, you know, 10, 30 or so, I was coming down off all the pain meds they'd given me to take away the pain. Because that's really all they're doing for a kidney stone, is they take away the initial pain, and then they give you a bunch of drugs when the pain comes back to try to help it not get worse. That you can bear it. That, that's all it is. You, there's really nothing to generally going to happen to you. I mean, it's funny watching people in the hospital deal with coming with kidney stones. They're kind of like, eh, whatever. Give them some drugs, send them home. This is a, because it's not that life-threatening, it's just painful. And so they really, it, it's not that big a deal to them. They kind of see you coming in, oh, a kidney stone. They kind, of, they kind of know before you even say anything. Well, all day Sunday, after I came down off the loopy drugs, I felt absolutely perfectly fine. And it felt really weird to feel like that, to have missed all that morning, to not come and teach, and to just be laying there feeling perfectly fine. Now, Monday morning happens, daughter and wife go, you know, off to, to work and things, and I'm there for a while, have some workers in my house, and I told them, listen, I'm, you know, I'm not feeling too great, and Monday morning we had a little pain, and so I'm not feeling great, so I'll probably just be in the bedroom here while you're working, and it hits, and it doesn't hit fat, it kind of it kind of grows as uh, like a, like you're heading up a hill, and so I can see it, I can feel it coming. And I'm like, okay, well, I can not do anything. And it just it gets worse and worse and worse. And so I, oh, it's, getting, it's getting back too close to what sent me to the hospital the day before. But now I have drugs, and so now it gets me to like, I'm just, boom, it hits really fast. And I am, I am starting to throw up, or getting ready to throw up. And I am shaking, because I actually, the pain gets so bad you shake your body begins to shiver, your fists shiver. And so I'm gonna throw up and I'm painful and I'm like, okay, let me just try to take some of the hydrocodone to hopefully after a little while it will you know, go away. I'm laying there on my knees in front of the toilet thinking I'm gonna throw up and I can't bear the pain. I have tears streaming down my face and I am pleading with God to help me. And in less than 30 seconds, the pain began to go away. And it has not returned to whole week. I would tell you, the pain had just disappeared. And I pleaded with God for probably a whole minute. I don't know how many times I asked God to take the pain away because I wasn't sure I could stand the moment. Didn't know what I was going to do. And in that moment, I thought about Philippians 3. 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because that context of that verse is, Paul is a prisoner who is suffering and who doesn't have enough to take care of himself, but is confident that Christ can take care of him. And very often it is in those weaknesses, I tell you that story, because it was in that weakness that my faith, my trust, grew even stronger that I knew God. There was no possible way within 30 seconds that the hydrocodone liquid I took works. It, it doesn't work within 15 minutes, typically. It didn't work in 30 seconds.
And God simply allowed me to not feel the pain in that moment. And you realize the power of God. And ultimately what we're going to come to in the conclusion of today's lesson is to understand that in order for us to really grasp the power of God, we have to understand we are weak. Because when we feel strong and when we feel like we can do anything, then we don't give place to God to change our lives. So I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I kind of pick it up in verse 7, but I want to start a little bit before that. So the clock is right today, right? I think we got a new one. It's not 517 anymore. Um, so I, I just want to give you a little background and the, the point of this letter. Second Corinthians is a letter Paul wrote. He wrote from the area of Macedonia. He's a little ways from getting there. And one of the purposes of, of writing this letter was to announce that he's coming. And the reason he wants to announce he's coming is because his arrival means that I'm going to take up the collection they have been taking, and I am going to take that collection to Jerusalem to the saints there who are in need. And so he, well, you know, like a lot of things, when you've been told and you've promised you're going to do something, but it's a long way in the future, at what point do you start doing it? Well, I think more than 50% of, of society tends to procrastinate towards the end. And so he was a little afraid that he would show up and they really hadn't been taking the collection. They hadn't been laying aside something every week to try and have a, because that's actually the context of 1 Corinthians 16 is a, is a special collection for the saints in Jerusalem. And he wanted them, just a little by little each week, take up a collection over some months so that when he got there, they could have a whole bunch of money to go help the saints who were really poor and needy in Jerusalem. And so chapters 8 and 9, are he deals with that exact issue. It's like encouraging them that you've got to complete what you said you would do. Okay, you, you got, I've been bragging, he actually says, I've been bragging on you to the people over in Ephesus area and telling them how wonderful you are about making up collection. Well, you need, to, you need to do what I said you've been doing. So he's reminding them of that. Well, then he comes into verse 10 and he changes the subject completely about the giving and the collection. And he t deals with the subject of I'm going to show up there and I have sent you a letter, 1 Corinthians, that I corrected you a lot and told you to change some things. You need to stop doing some stuff. And I'm going to show up. And when I show up, you need to have changed. Because if you haven't changed, I'm going to have to deal with that. And so he says here at the beginning, I'm going to actually start in verse 1. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. It's generally thought that that first verse contains in part something that they were say, people were saying about him. Well, when he's with you, he's really humble and he's just so gentle and, and sweet. But when he writes to you, he, he talks like he's this big, strong you know, guy and he's mean and he's super bold. He's like, that accusation, he, I think he is kind of writing there. And he says in verse 2, I beg you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. So he says, you think, some people say, oh, in writing, I'm really bold and tough. Well, when I show up, I don't want to be bold and tough. I want to be kind and gentle with you. But I am going to be bold and tough with some of you. If you don't change. So that, that's kind of what he's, he's, so his letter is also warning them. That I, I told you you need to repent before. I've written you letters to repent. You really need to do that or I want to deal with the fact that you are not doing that. And so he said, for though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. He's not like a soldier, not like a, 
That's not the kind of fight we're in. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now just think about it for a second. A stronghold, by the way, is a fortified city. Those, those big walled cities that they would go into and armies would come. You know, they'd have to take forever to try and break through those walls. He says, God's power, the word of God, by the way, the divine power is to break down strongholds. But it's not the walls of big cities. It's the walls we build in our minds around ideas and thoughts and behaviors. How often are we surprised when people have been in a terrible situation and they stay in that situation for a long time? Why are we surprised by that? Because when we're not in it, we're going, why didn't you just change? Why didn't you leave? Why didn't? But very often, people don't. People don't change when it's good for them. People don't change what they believe just because you show them facts or truth. People have a tendency to build fortresses around their ideas and their behaviors and don't want to change them. And repentance really is breaking them down, breaking the walls and the fortresses down of the ideas and our behaviors and doing something different. And most of people don't do that extremely well. That's why a lot of people, and it's often true, people don't really change. They are what they are. We'd like them to be different and to change. God would often like that. We would often like that. But it's hard. It doesn't come easy. Because it really requires breaking down the barriers we have often built in our minds. So God, Paul is saying, I'm coming and I'm going to help you. If you don't, I'm not waging war like knocking like a soldier. I'm waging war to try and tear down those destructive thoughts that we all have. And so he says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Is, it, is every thought of ours to do that? To obey Christ? If we're all honest, we know that not every thought of ours is to obey Christ. Hopefully, if we're really mature, when thoughts come in to do things that are not godly, we say, get away. But the purpose of the divine power of God is to get every thought, every part of the brain and mind functioning to work for, for God. And he says, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So part of this letter is, I don't want to come and figuratively spank you. I want to come and be kind and generous and loving with you. So he's sending them a warning. It's a little bit like parents, right? When your kids are doing something that might get them in trouble, do you sometimes give them a little warning? Listen, what I tell you about, they like, oh, yeah, yeah. Now, sometimes they still do that stuff, and you still get in trouble, don't they? But sometimes you, you don't want to, as a parent, you don't want to do that, do you? You don't actually like punishing your children. And so you warn them, hoping they, that warning alone will be enough. See, he just got one. Mom whispered in his ear. Now he's terrified. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But, so he comes at this point, and he's just telling them, listen, I don't want to come and deal with your disobedience. I want you to think about Christ. He says, look at verse 7. Look what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. He says, for even if I boast a little too much of our authority which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, 
I will not be ashamed. Paul was given authority by Christ to deal with the church. He had the right, he had the power, he had the, he had the authority from God to deal with disobedience in the Christians. But he says, I, you know, I'm not here. I'm here to kind of strengthen you and build you. I don't want to knock you down. I don't want to cut you. I want to build you up and make you stronger. And so even though I, I might have, you know, said I can do these things, that's really not the point. He said, I do not want to appear to be frightening you with, with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak. Kind of goes along with the beginning of the chapter. That in presence, he's kind of feeling like meek and mild. And, well, when you, read, when you read his stuff, you wow, what, what a powerful guy. And he says, let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. So now he begins to talk about people. The, Gert, the church in Corinth obviously has some people in it who are kind of elevating themselves. I probably should take kind of out of there. We have people in the church who are elevating themselves. They are, they are boasting. They are... In something, it could be it could be their their wisdom, it could be their authority, it could be their power, it could be you know it could be all kinds of different things. We see that with people. People have a tendency to boast about our own strengths, kind of ignore our own weaknesses, but say hey, or think about we're better than other people because of what we are and who we are, and the and this pat and the. The things that we can do. Our talents make us better than you. That's kind of what people have a tendency to do. And so that's happening in the church. Paul isn't going to put up with it forever. And he's going to have to deal with some of these people who are kind of being arrogant. And having some kind of a influence on the church. So he says, we will not... Uh, well, what I pick? Verse 13, but we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, for we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. He says, I'm hoping that as we came to you with the gospel and you have grown, that you're gonna, your growth and your faith will grow so much that you are going to allow me to move on. You're going to get stronger so that I can go out there. And then he says, so, but I, so I'm, I'm not going to boast in other people's work and other, and other things. I'm just going to boast in what we do. But he says in verse 17, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. So it isn't us going, look, well, I'm better than this than you are. And I'm, that doesn't matter. In the end, it doesn't matter about your strengths because no matter how strong you are, you will not find yourself in the presence of God in eternity without the power and strength of the Lord. And that's what he wants us to understand. That his strength is often demonstrated because we are weak. And so... Go ahead and hit that next one. So I want to just, this, this passage, in fact, uh, to boast, it. so in the Old Testament, this same concept, Jeremiah wrote, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. So he says, you're smart, don't go tell everybody how smart you are. Because you know what? It doesn't really matter. 
How many smart people have done a lot of stupid stuff? Lots of them. All of them. The, the, one of the greatest problems, I think it was told, I remember my, my sister who had a, had a terrible drug problem died you know, a couple of decades ago. Um, my mom told me when, I remember when she was kind of in the midst of her difficulty, she said one of her problems is how smart she is. She almost never gets caught. She didn't get caught when she was stealing. She didn't get caught. She, almost, she never went to jail. My, my, my sister broke so many laws, committed so many crimes that she never got punished for, all to support her drug habit. And my, she's like, she would have been better off not being so smart and not being able to figure out a way to get away with it because it would have helped her to not continue to stay and affording or buying the drugs as long as she did. Sometimes smart people make arguments that sound really good and all they really are are excuses to do what they want to do. So don't boast about how smart you are. He says, let not the mighty man big strong guys, right? When people are big and strong, do they let you know they're big and strong? You kind of, you know, people know they're big and strong. They know they're bigger than everybody else. We were talking about dogs yesterday morning and how almost all of us guys hate the little, the little dogs that act super tough, that that, and and are super aggressive and super mean. Often, we wouldn't put up with that in a Rottweiler. Wouldn't put up with that in a German Shepherd. And we figured they'd kill us because they, those have the, the ability to kill us. The Pomeranian doesn't. <laughs> One good kick, it, it's, go, it's over. <laughs> so we put up with acting like it's big and strong when it's a little teeny thing. But if it's big, we, we can't deal with it because they really can kill you. They don't, big dogs, they don't have to, they know they're big. They know they're strong. They don't have to like show it to everybody. I have to talk about it all the time. But he says, you're a big, strong guy. Don't boast it how strong you are. You know, big, strong guys, you know, when you're faced with hard things in life, knock you to your knees as much as anybody else. The strength. Physical strength doesn't overcome everything in this world, just like wisdom doesn't overcome everything in this world. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. I think this is a hard one. Of all, all of these people tend to boast in the, these things. Rich people tell them to let you know they're rich. Right? And when they let you know they're rich, what are they really letting you know about their riches? What is the implication when rich people let you know they're rich? I'm smarter or better in some way. It, just, it, isn't, it often isn't true. They're often, might be wise, they might have talent, they might have opportunities that others don't have. They, and we, have, we struggle with that sometimes. Now I grew up, had a very rich uncle, my dad was pretty wealthy when I was young. And, and both of them, I actually feel really grateful that I had a lot of wealth around me when I was little. Because I also saw how dumb they were. I, I mean, just my uncle being completely ungodly and bitter, and no matter how much money he had and the, and the millions of dollars he had when he died, there was nobody around him because he alienated everybody. Everybody hated him. My mom was about the only even family member that liked to be, that was willing to be around him. My, and my dad, he, he, he used to brag about having the Midas touch. I think my dad really didn't understand the lesson of King Midas <laughs> because he, he kind of had the Midas touch, and it kind of came back to bite him. And so I, I saw that, too. 
money. And, and I actually was asked by a guy, my dad wasn't really bright guy. He was just, he was a hard worker. My dad was a very hard worker and, and was really ambitious. Um, but he wasn't really bright. He wasn't, I mean, he wasn't exceptionally bright. He wasn't a dumb, dumb guy, he just, but he wasn't exceptionally bright or anything. But you know what he did? He started a business in the late 50s and early 60s. And you know what happened to people who generally started businesses in the United States in the late 50s and early 60s? They prospered. You know why? Because this was the, one of the highest levels of prosperity the world has ever seen. It, everybody was prospering in the late 50s and early 60s, business-wise. In the 70s, it was a totally different thing. <laughs> For those of us old enough to remember the 70s, it was not a time of prosperity, generally. Some people did, but it, the economy was often very bad in the 70s. And so people who have these things sometimes think these things mean a lot. And God's saying they don't. Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love. And for all those in this congregation, remember that Hebrew word has said. That's this word. Justice and righteousness in the earth. For these things I delight, declares the Lord. The Lord is telling you, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how rich you are. I care whether you know me. And you understand me. And then you will understand my righteousness. Boast in him. That's what Paul is writing here in 2 Corinthians. And so, kind of picking up in verse 11. Paul begins to boast and compare himself with these people who have been exalting themselves in Corinth. So he's going to, you know, he says, I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness. Do bear with me in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband, or to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But he goes on and he lists a lot of stuff that he did. I don't want to read all of it. But, you know, he begins to say, you know, coming down a little ways, um, Verse 7, he says, I did not commit a sin, in, or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. So we actually learned something here that Paul, when he helped start the church in Corinth, they didn't pay him. They didn't support him financially. He, other people supported him so he could do that. Kind of what he talked about earlier, hoping the Corinth would be able to do that for him someplace else. But it, that happened because he didn't want to take money from the court. Didn't want them to give him the money to do that work. Didn't want to feel like he was peddling or, or selling the gospel for his own benefit. And so he preached the gospel free of charge to him. Didn't want to burden anybody. He says, and so I refrain and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As Verse 10, as the truth of Christ is in me. This boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. And what I am doing I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. There are people who are obviously elevating themselves to Paul's level of authority and, and ability and, and God-given talents and he's saying they just don't have it God hasn't done this for them like he did for me he's not trying to boast that that makes him great he, he has said many many times he writes a lot of he's only an apostle because God chose him to be one he didn't deserve it he's the least worthy person to be in the position he was but God asked him to do it and he did it and so he says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 
So it is no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. As I repeat, let me let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I may boast a little. So he gives a long list of things here, and this is a list. I don't want to repeat everything. Just notice a couple things. In this boasting, he's going to boast in kind of human accomplishments or human positives, we might say. And he says, um, start, you know, he says, whatever anyone else ha dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool, I dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Gives us some understanding of the people. He's dealing with some Jews who are, who are kind of elevating themselves there. He says, are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. But he, in a real fleshly says, they say they're servants of Christ. He goes, but I do more serving than they do. In all honesty. He, I mean, it was probably a really cut and dry kind of thing you could look at. Where's what Paul had done? Here's what they had done. He's like, well, yeah, I do more than they do. But he's saying, he said, this doesn't make, make any difference. This is why he has to keep apologizing through it. And so he says, with great with far greater labors, far more punishment, imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Now, notice the things he first said. Here, I work harder, I, I get beaten more, and, and, and people almost kill me more. <laughs> it doesn't sound like, it doesn't sound that great, does it? And he says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. You know, we don't even know about most of those. We can, I, I actually showed um, on, on uh, Wednesday's class kind of where Paul was when he wrote the book of Romans, a little bit after he wrote the book here of 2 Corinthians. And you can actually see in the book of Acts where he was when he writes this in his travels and when you read in the book of Acts about after his conversion to this point you don't read about almost any of this the only shipwrecks we know about happened after it I mean he had been through so much we didn't even know about when you read about him going through the book of Acts there's so many things happen to him that is not recorded there. he says on frequent journeys and dangers of, from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often not having enough food, not having enough water. He says, apart from other things, in verse 28, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? You know, I think we sometimes forget that, and, and I'll use this one example here before we get close to the end. A few years back, we were doing a, a little kind of in-group uh, meeting. We were doing an in-group meeting about all of us learning to do something. What else could we learn to do? for the church, for God. What, what are we doing now, and what's kind of the next step? So we talked about, you know, being a teacher. We talked about being a preacher. We talked about song lead. We talked about being an elder. And we had all you guys here, and people would ask questions. So we had some class times. People could ask questions from people who were already doing those jobs. And I think it was Mendel who asked uh, Patrick and Dave at the time, how many hours do you spend being an, el being an elder? And I th Dave actually gave him an, an actual answer. He kind of calculated how many hours a week he would do eldering stuff. And I kind of went, I got afterwards, I went, let me, because that, that kind of boils something down a little too simply. I said, Min already had a number of kids, not, not all of them, but <laughs> he's already had a number. And so Mendel, I said, Mendel, how many hours do you spend fathering? 
Would you ever count how much you are a father or a mother by eight hours for that job? Because what is the ta what is the the hardest thing about the job is really the responsibility that is 24 seven, right? And that's kind of what he says here. The hardest thing about being Paul was his responsibility for all these churches he started. <laughs> Why did he write so many letters? Because he started so many churches. He had to write back to them. He had to like help keep teaching them. He had to keep raising up these babes in Christ. He felt responsible for them. The weight of that was on him all the time. And I think a lot of people have jobs like that. Your job, some people have jobs where you clock out and you don't even think about that job until you clock in again. But lots of jobs, especially those that come with management, responsibility, authority, you don't get to leave them, do you? They don't leave your brain. They don't leave your shoulders. You are kind of, they kind of dominate your life because you're responsible. So on Monday morning at 8 a.m., you don't get to just show up. You've got to make sure all over that weekend is everything ready for them to work at 8 a.m. Monday morning. <laughs> so your responsibility never goes. And so there's a weight upon it. And that's what Paul's talking about there. He says, in verse 30, though, he says, If I boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. And this is the part I'm really getting. This is kind of the conclusion of this. Paul says, listen, I've done all this stuff. It's like, well, look at all this stuff. And I, I do it more. I've done more than other people. I work harder than most of the other people. But he says, you know, I, this stuff is kind of foolishness. You know where my boasting is? I'm going to boast in how weak I am. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hand. Here's a great and powerful Paul who is in a basket with somebody with a rope letting him down so he can try and escape being killed. It doesn't say, seem real powerful, does it? That doesn't seem real strong. And like, oh, well, you know, we look at, and we always like these strong, silent type heroes, you know, that just stand up and they, they're just like, you know, impressive. And they don't get afraid when people, you know, are threatening them. And they, you know, they can take it. And they're strong. And Paul's like uh, running away, <laughs> scared. Because he was weak. They were trying to kill him. He was like, I'm going to run away. It doesn't seem strong. Because he, he wasn't. He was being weak. He says, I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Which means the heaven where God is, by the way. He says, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Now, most people think he's talking about himself there. He just is not saying himself. He's saying, listen, I was actually either, body, you know, whether body or in the body or not in the body, I was in the presence of God. But he's like, I'm, that doesn't matter. Even if he had been in the presence of God, it doesn't matter. Now, how many times if somebody in human form, other human beings, said, I was in the presence of God, how much would they tell you how much better that make me than you? What would most people do with that? Oh, I must be more righteous than you. I must be more godly than you. I must be more faithful than you. That's what most people would do. But Paul isn't doing that. And so, he says, though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, I, for I would be speaking the truth. But he says, if, if I were to tell you all things I've done, I wouldn't tell you lies. They'd be true things. But he, they don't matter. He says, I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations... 
A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. So you think about this idea, what he says, the surpassing greatness of his revelations, all the revelations that God gave through Paul. Did Paul have a lot? Yeah, how, how many of the letters of the New Testament Paul write? Right, about half of them. Who is the one person we kind of know in the New Testament more than most? After the gospel, you know, when you get out of the gospels, the rest of the Bible, Paul's pretty central. <laughs> because he had a lot of revelations he gave, and he taught, and he went about teaching. But he said, but you know what? And I think a lot of us don't realize this. Paul couldn't see very well. There's a reason he didn't write any of his letters. So here it is, all of his letters. He didn't write them down because he couldn't see very well. He had to write with large letters in order to see them. He signed a couple of them with large letters. But he... I don't know if that's a thorn in the flesh referred to here or not, but he, he had some thorn in his flesh. He says, to keep him from being conceited. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited, thinking he was more important and, more, and bigger than he was. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's what God said to him. On Monday, when I was pleading with God to take away the pain, I was sitting there thinking, this verse, is God going to tell me, my grace is sufficient for you, and you can deal with the pain. Now, he gave me relief from the pain. But sometimes, he doesn't do that every time, does he? He hasn't done that every time for me. He won't do that every time for you. Sometimes his grace is sufficient. And we will just bear the difficulty of life. And so he says, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. And what did Paul say? Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insult, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. See, when we think we're strong, God's like, well, okay, go easy. You want to be strong, do it yourself, go ahead. How many times as a parent have you ever had a child that wanted to do it themselves and you're, they're too little and they can't quite pick it up or they can't quite lift it, but they're going to do it and they're dragging it along? You think, okay, whatever. <laughs> now, if you tell you, he's like, hey, I can give you a little hand. No, 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 I'm doing it myself. Okay, whatever. And then they finally get so tired they can't go over and then you just pick it up and carry it. And they're like, oh, wow. That's us and God. We try to carry things God, we can't carry. And we're much stronger when we understand we are incapable of doing this godly discipleship thing without him. Until we really grasp that we are nothing without God, then we won't be as strong as we can be. Go ahead and hit that next slide here in this passage that we read at the beginning Isaiah 40 29 to 31 he gives power to the faint and to him who has no might he increases strength now just think about that for a second does he give power to the person who's really strong no he gives power to the faint to him who has no might he increases the strength even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like, mount up with wings like eagles. They shall, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That image is given to those who grasp they are nothing without God. That they are weak without Him. That we are nothing. Now I want you to think about it. We end of this image. We think about Samson. 
and Samson judging Israel and big and strong and long hair. And he's like, and, and we always picture him as really huge, right? And yet even the people that saw him do his miraculous feats of strength were like, where does he get that strength? They were like going, whoa, look how big his muscles are. I, always, I kind of picture that he might have been smaller than we think and not as big as we think because people were going, I wonder why he's so strong. But finally, he did think he was big and strong. He could do anything, nothing. He was that strong, silent type, right? Was he a very righteous, strong, silent guy? No. It wasn't until his eyes were put out, God took away his strength, that he ultimately learned where real strength comes from. When he humbled himself before God and asked God to give him the strength to defeat his enemies. And God gave it to him at the very end of his life. He finally realized it wasn't his strength that was important, it was God's strength. And that's a thing for all of us to grow to, to grow that we understand and we can actually hold on to those things that we're weak in. Because you know what? I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be great at everything. I don't have to have talent in everything. God has, his grace is sufficient to overcome my weakness. 